Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Two COVID hotspots, two grim milestones. Quebec and Ontario posting some concerning numbers today. Ontario reports 1,000 new cases. Why doctors hope it will make people pay attention. I am afraid that we are gonna see the catastrophic loss of life that we saw in the spring. Will an extension of Quebec's partial lockdown help stop the surge there? We aren't getting things under control as well as we probably could. So what do these big numbers mean? Our doctors are here to talk about it. GOP stronghold Arizona is looking a little blue these days, but some aren't convinced. You all think Biden's leading. It's so funny. You have no idea how many there are that are for Trump. Paul Hunter in a state that could decide it all. This is The National. We know we're in COVID-19 second wave. The question tonight, how much bigger will it get? Rising rates in the West, isolated outbreaks on the East Coast, and the biggest numbers in central Canada. Ontario alone broke 1,000 new cases for the first time today after another record yesterday. And a string of steadily worsening numbers that has average daily cases for the province trending up. Pressure is building in hospitals. Bed occupancy has tripled in the past month to nearly 300 patients. Angelina King shows us for a growing number, this is already a life and death struggle. A small town in eastern Ontario has a big problem. Hawkesbury is now home to the province's worst nursing home outbreak. Three people have died at this facility. A third of the residents have COVID-19, so do nearly a quarter of the staff, totaling 78 cases. Family members are, um, are nervous or they're uh, anxious. The home has been calling for help since the beginning of the month. Now the Red Cross and paramedics are there. We're working hard, the staff is there, and everybody's doing double shift. In the last few days, cases at long-term care homes have spiked dramatically. I'm afraid that we are going to see the catastrophic loss of life that we saw in the spring. Dr. Nathan Stahl says to avoid that, staffing levels must increase and community spread decrease. He hopes today's record-breaking number will help. Reaching a threshold like this may actually motivate decision makers or policy makers differently because as humans, we're biased towards numbers in this way, and it's the same kind of reason why we price goods at $4.99 rather than $5. But in some regions, there's still pushback against the possibility of tighter restrictions like those in Toronto and Ottawa. In Halton, we have never had a case generated in any of our cafes or restaurants or patios, and, and as long as that is true, I think they should be allowed to stay, stay open. Ontario's health ministry says today's high number could be thanks to Thanksgiving. For epidemiologists, combined with numbers in nursing homes and hospitals, it paints a bleak picture. We have a growing epidemic in the province, and there's not really at this point any indication that we're, we're plateauing. Epidemiologists say this coming week will be very telling in Ontario. The province should be able to determine whether those targeted restrictions put in place two weeks ago help bring numbers down. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec surpassed a COVID-19 milestone, 100,000 cases since the pandemic began, almost half the country's total. Now, Quebec's average daily new cases have plateaued, but its second wave is still the worst in the country. The province leads Canada in COVID hospitalizations, with bed occupancy more than doubling over the past month. Verity Stevenson shows us how those numbers play out on the streets of the province and asks an expert why stricter measures haven't seemed to slow the spread very much. After 10 years of bustling feasts in a hip converted garage, this is what Montreal's popular Grumman 78 restaurant looks like now. Owners are packing up, they rely on summer business and just couldn't outlast this pandemic. By closing the, the restaurants like that, you really, you're doing irreparable damage to the social fabric of the city. But it seems strict measures imposed at the beginning of October that closed restaurant dining rooms are likely to be extended. But right now, uh, the odds uh, for uh, some of the measures are not good that will change them. 
In fact, Quebec has now surpassed 100,000 cases, and though daily cases seem to be letting up slightly, the seven-day average was at more than 1,000 cases per day for much of October. The fact that we, we aren't getting things under control as well as we probably could is, is probably more of the issue than necessarily the 100,000 unto itself. Bacon says the messaging around this month of restrictions has been confusing. He says what's worrying about this second wave is more young people getting sick enough to use hospital beds. Younger people that get sick and end up going to the hospital uh, tend to have worse disease. They tend to be there for longer. Which could mean more strain on an already faltering health care system and a tough winter with more isolation and more restaurants closing. McGowan says although heartbreaking, her decision to close was the right one. But it's been hard on her eight-year-old daughter too. I miss my community and, and, and Grumman was my home and, and Ruby by extension feels that loss herself. So it's been an extremely sad time. Verity Stevenson, CBC News, Montreal. Manitoba set a record today that no one wanted to see. 77 people are in hospital for COVID-19. That is the highest number ever. 15 of those in intensive care. And four more people have died, including a man in his 50s and two residents of a long-term care home, the site of the province's deadliest outbreak. Today, Manitoba recorded 161 new cases, not far off a recent record high. And two more deaths from COVID-19 recorded in New Brunswick today. One person in their 40s, the other in their 70s. A small but alarming figure for the province, raising the death toll to six. Both people had underlying conditions, according to public health officials. New Brunswick reported two new cases today as it struggles to contain two outbreaks. And we'll take a closer look at all of this with Dr. Isaac Bogosh and Dr. Lenora Saxinger. I'll speak with them about everything from the impact of shutdowns to the troubling numbers out of Alberta. That's in about 15 minutes. As the second wave of COVID-19 cases balloons across Europe, countries are imposing new restrictions. First to Spain, where a new curfew took effect tonight. Anything open to the public must now close between 11 at night and 6 in the morning. Local authorities can adjust that by an hour and ban travel between regions. In Italy, new restrictions don't take effect until tomorrow, but they were being protested today. Bars, restaurants and ice cream stands will have to close down by 6 in the evening, while movie theatres, gyms and pools are shut down completely. The country saw a record number of new cases today, more than 21,000. The UK is considering loosening self-isolation time from two weeks to 10 days. A cabinet minister says they want to see what the science says before making that change. Researchers at King's College London found less than 11% of COVID contacts stayed isolated for the full quarantine period. Of course, COVID is a big issue on the U.S. campaign trail. After a record high Friday of 83,000 cases and nearly matching it on sun Saturday, the number of new cases appeared to drop on Sunday. The state-by-state -state count coming in around 60,000, with the total number of deaths now over 225,000. Still, as Ellen Morrow shows us, Donald Trump continues to insist that things are improving, despite the evidence. A pre-pandemic scene playing out today. A president eager to show life getting back to normal, even though it isn't. Across the U.S., the virus is surging, with experts warning of a difficult winter. We are reporting 3,874 new cases. Illinois' rising numbers bringing the state's health director to tears. Excuse me, please. Thank you very much. Still at every Thank swing you. state stop, President Trump down in the polls, downplaying the virus. Even without the vaccines, we're rounding the turn. It's going to be over. Today, Trump's chief of staff admitted controlling COVID is no longer the priority, falsely equating it with the far less deadly flu. We're not going to control the pandemic. Why aren't we going to get control the because, pandemic? Be because it is a contagious virus, just like the flu. Yeah. Joe Biden did not have any official in-person appearances today, but in a statement wrote, this administration has given up on their basic duty to protect the American people. In another Trump team outbreak, five aides to Vice President Mike Pence have reportedly tested positive. 
Despite being in close contact with at least one of them, Pence, who has so far tested negative, traveled to Battleground, North Carolina. It is great to be in the Tar Heel State. More than 50 million Americans have already voted, surpassing 2016's early voting total with nine days still to go. The polls were wrong in 2016, but right now they show a strong lead for Joe Biden nationally, and he's ahead in several swing states. President Trump visited six states this weekend. That busy travel schedule and his rosy picture of the pandemic, all part of the strategy to try to hold on to the White House. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Just over a week left now until the election. Let's check in with the CBC's Eric Grenier, who's been tracking the numbers. And, and Eric, what are the polls suggesting? Well, they're still suggesting that Joe Biden has a big national lead over Donald Trump right now. We estimate his lead is just over nine points nationwide. And that's a bigger lead than Hillary Clinton had at this stage of the election in 2016. And in terms of the Electoral College, Joe Biden does have an advantage. We estimate right now that he is far enough in enough states to give him 305 electoral college votes. So that's more than the 207 you need to win the uh, presidency. Donald Trump is behind with 126 uh, uh, electoral college votes. And there's 107 electoral college votes right now that we're deeming toss-up states. Even if Donald Trump were to win all of those uh, with the other states that Joe Biden has a lead in, he would have enough to take the White House. And, and Eric, let's talk about Florida. Yeah, it's one of those toss-up states. And we all remember uh, the 2000 election, just how important it was. But in this election campaign, it's been very close. The polls have been uh, largely in Biden's favor, but only by a couple of points. And it is actually going to be one of the states that will be reporting relatively early and relatively quickly on election night. If Joe Biden wins Florida on election night, that'll be a really strong indication that he's probably going to win the presidency. If Donald Trump is winning Florida on election night, we might not know for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, who the next president will be. Eric Grenier, thank you. Thank you. An unprecedented election delivered historic results in British Columbia last night. Premier John Horgan and the NDP projected to win the party's biggest ever majority government. Some half a million mail-in ballots remain to be counted, though, meaning final results may not be known for weeks. Briar Stewart has the latest. It was in the suburban cities around Vancouver where voters helped give the NDP the majority it was looking for as ridings that were traditionally liberal went orange. Be, having been part of the community now for a few years, I wasn't really surprised it went NDP. I mean, it's kind of been, uh, that's kind of been more the language. So they did a good job with the pand pandemic. I would say they did a very good job. So that's why they came back in the power. When John Horgan and the NDP called an early election last month, it was a strategic move to strike when the party was popular. <laughs> It paid off. While there were no crowds at party headquarters, it was still a celebration. The reason uh, our message resonated in Richmond, it resonated in, in, in Langley, is because we were talking about things that matter to those families. The party is poised to pick up 55 seats thanks to voters in the Lower Mainland. In the interior, most ridings elected Liberals. But that party had a dismal night. It's projected to pick up only 29 seats, the fewest in nearly two decades. Leadership questions are swirling. I'm proud to have presented a bold plan on behalf of the BC Liberal Party to move our party into the future. While the Green Party and its newly elected leader are expected to take three seats. We will use our voices very effectively in the legislature. I think Bonnie Henry is kind of been a bit of a secret weapon for the... This political professor says the province's handling of the pandemic thus far helped the NDP win a second term. And I think that the general sense was we're doing fairly well compared with other jurisdictions. Uh, why change horses in the middle of a race when we seem to be ahead? The final results will not be in until November, but the premier says he's going back to work, picking up where the government left off before the campaign, but now with the majority. Briar Stewart, CBC News. Vancouver. Voters in Saskatchewan head to the polls tomorrow in an election poised to extend Canada's longest serving provincial government currently in power. But as Bonnie Allen reports, even without a victory, this vote will be a crucial test for the future of the province's NDP. Like so many others, the leader of the Saskatchewan New Democratic Party, Ryan Miley, cast his ballot early. 
The family doctor is a political underdog. He's trying to do what the last two NDP leaders could not. First, win his own seat, yeah. and then increase the NDP seats overall. I'm hearing from people that want to vote for a government that cares about them. The NDP was once a dominant force in this province, but fell from glory in the 90s. Like, I, I just think we lost a lot when we lost our hospital. The NDP inherited a huge debt from the progressive conservatives, then shut down rural hospitals and schools. The Saskatchewan party under Brad Wall won three landslide victories starting in 2007. Welcome to the Saskatoon Big Honkin' Rally. Today it holds 48 seats compared to the NDP's 13. This hasn't been the traditional kind of campaign or year. And yet Scott Moe still campaigns on what the NDP did more than two decades ago. Do we go forward into a bright, promising, prosperous future or do we go back to the dark days of the NDP. It's remarkable, right? It's as if Ontario elections centered around Mike Harris and Bob Ray. Like it's just, it's, it's really unusual. Uh, you know, the short version is that it works. There's a lot at stake for the NDP. Some say their very existence, and that's kind of hard to believe in Saskatchewan. The advantage they have in that area is there's not a third party coming up to easily replace them. The NDP leader insists he's in it to win it all. We have a bad government right now. We have Scott Moe who's not good at his job. We need a premier that's ready to work with the people of Saskatchewan and make the right choices. For me to not be in it to win it would be irresponsible. But according to the polls, the question isn't whether Scott Moe's Saskatchewan party will win, but rather by how much. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Saskatoon. Voters also head to the polls in Toronto tomorrow as candidates battle over two key federal by-elections. Nine are running in the riding of Toronto Centre as they look to fill the seat of former Finance Minister Bill Morneau following his sudden resignation in August. Newly elected Green Party leader Annamie Paul is among the notable candidates. In York Centre, six people are in the running to replace former Liberal MP Michael Levitt, including People's Party of Canada leader Maxime Bernier. Another show of defiance today in Caledonia, Ontario. Demonstrators show their support for community efforts to stop the development of a subdivision. They've occupied the site since July, but things heated up on Thursday after a judge granted the developer a permanent injunction against the camp. Since then, there have been calls to talk this out from the Ontario Premier, the leader of the demonstrators, and today, the Federal Ministry of Indigenous Services. Only 24 residents still remain in a remote Ontario First Nation tonight because of a growing water crisis. The last of about 400 evacuees landed in Thunder Bay on Saturday. There's been a boil water order there for 25 years, said to be the longest ever. But things got worse this week when an oily sheen was seen on the water supply. The Indigenous Services Ministry said it will pay for the evacuation and the emergency water for those who stayed to watch over things. When the pandemic grounded flights by the thousands, many people hoping for a ticket refund were handed vouchers instead. Thousands complained to the Canadian Transportation Agency. Now CBC News has learned not a single one of those complaints has been settled. Ashley Burke has that story. Rob McLean and his wife have spent six months fighting for a refund for a trip they never took. Instead, they're holding a $5,000 voucher. It's a shame that we're left fighting for this. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's frustrating and it's uh, not fair that they can keep our money like this. The couple planned a dream vacation to Antigua for a 40th birthday in April, but Sunwing called it off due to COVID-19. At the same time, the pandemic badly hurt his business. Now they're living off only one paycheck and fear they could have to sell their house. I mean, $5,000, there's five months of mortgage right there. They asked the Prime Minister for help. His office echoed what the Transport Minister has been saying for months. If somebody is unhappy with the fact that they didn't get a refund, they can go to the Canadian Transportation Agency and put their case forward. The McLeans did that, but six months later are still waiting. CBC News has learned that not one complaint out of the 10,000 filed since mid-March have been dealt with. The CTA said that it's still dealing with a record-setting backlog from before the pandemic. 
in other countries, people have refunds in pocket. They've had them for months. Uh, why is Canada so far behind? It doesn't make sense. Airlines have been asking for a bailout to survive. The government's still studying options, but it's clear there's no public appetite for that to happen unless consumers are paid back first. This week, some movement. While well, Air Canada said it's already been refunding some tickets, WestJet now says it will start doing so next month. What you see now is kind of a warming up of the industry to the demands of the federal government so that it kind of clears the way for some potential airline bailouts by the government. A potential bailout families like the McLeans hope is contingent on refunding passengers who never left the ground. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Our Go Public team has been hearing from owners of the Nissan Leaf, one of the top selling electric vehicles, but earlier models have started to lose their charge too quickly. One owner says the company seems to prefer he simply buy a brand new vehicle, not exactly an eco-friendly solution. Diane Buckner has the story. When Clayton Brander bought a used 2013 Nissan Leaf, he knew the battery would need to be replaced at some point. Now his car won't go as far on a charge, so the time has come, and so has a problem. I can't find out how to get a battery. I can't find out how much a replacement battery would cost, even though rough estimates that are being given by people on the floor say in excess of $15,000, which is more than I paid for the vehicle three years ago. He's tried three local repair shops, two Nissan dealerships, and Nissan Canada repeatedly for weeks. The only concrete suggestion from Nissan so far, buy a brand new Leaf. It seems like these things are gonna end up in the landfill, I'm gonna have to replace it, which means all the greenhouse gas conservation is out the window. Introducing the 100% electric Nissan Leaf. Innovation for the planet. Lots of love for the environment in Nissan's commercials, but there wasn't much love on the part of American Leaf owners who launched a class action lawsuit over the battery capacity in early models. The suit was settled, but the resolution is no help to people like Clayton Brander. I think Nissan should be quite loyal to some of these early adopters because it helped them to get the car out on the market, get some acceptance and grow from there. This electric vehicle engineering professor says nowadays batteries are built to last the battery will actually outlive the car by a long stretch. Nissan Canada said in a statement to CBC News it's hopeful to find a resolution to Clayton Brander's problem, but wouldn't say how or at what cost. Brander needs a solution quickly. He's hesitant to even turn on the heat in the car these days because that too uses his limited battery power. I love the vehicle. I just think Nissan needs to do a bit more to support these uh, early purchasers. He says chucking an otherwise perfectly good 2013 into a landfill is the opposite of eco-friendly, which is why he purchased a Nissan Leaf in the first place. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Our Go Public team counts on viewers like you to send in ideas. If you'd like them to look into your complaint, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Thanksgiving gatherings could be behind the recent surge in COVID-19 cases in some parts of the country. Up next, our panel of doctors break down the latest numbers, what you need to know about the pace of the pandemic. Plus, why all eyes are on Arizona in 2020. Watch what happens in Maricopa County, watch what happens in Arizona. Arizona is going for Joe Biden. Could this traditionally red state go blue? And later, a birthday wish come true. I just asked for someone to write happy birthday on the card. Yeah. And that's all I thought was coming in. How strangers around the world answered a simple request. We'll be right back. We have to get these numbers down. I am very concerned about the rise in numbers. It's spreading right across the province, which is, which is concerning. Officials and political leaders clearly worried, including in Ontario, where shutdowns went into effect on October 10th. But the rate of new cases continues to rise. And in Alberta, which has held back on reimposing shutdowns and watched its average daily new cases triple over the past month. So let's get a sense of what these numbers mean to the experts. We're joined by infectious disease specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh in Toronto and Dr. Lenora Saxinger in Edmonton. And Dr. Bogosh, let's start with you. Thanksgiving was about two weeks ago. Do you think that's a factor in the Ontario case numbers we're seeing now? 
It certainly could be. It, the timing fits perfectly. And of course, the messaging around Thanksgiving was pretty clear. Don't socialize with others. Don't go into other people's homes. Keep it to the family unit. But uh, certainly the, the timing does fit with the spike uh, from, uh, from possibly people getting together during Thanksgiving. Now, on the other hand, the, the new res restrictions were brought in around the same time. When might we see the impact of that? Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And certainly we know that these restrictions were imposed around two-ish weeks ago. And there's a window period of time where we would expect to see no changes. And we'd only start to see the earliest changes around now. So during this window period of when the restrictions were imposed and when we expect to see changes, it's not impossible to see growth in cases during that time. So I really think the next week and and two weeks ahead will be very telling to see if there's any significant impact from those restrictions in alleviating the number of new cases in the community. And Dr. Saxinger, Alberta doesn't release numbers on the weekend, but what's your analysis of what we've seen coming out of your province over the last couple of weeks? Well, I think it's profoundly concerning, honestly. Um, the, the rate of rise has been non-reassuring for a while, but the last several days have seen very high case numbers. We're starting to see um, more people coming into hospital, and so I, I suspect that this is legitimately a big concern for us. And what are you expecting to see or looking to see in the next couple of weeks in Alberta? Well, we did have um, a suggestion of voluntary restriction put forward around October 9th or 10th. Um, if that was going to be beneficial, that should start having effect any time now, honestly. Um, I think that there's going to be more discussion about some targeted public health interventions. I'm not sure what that discussion will look like or what shape it will take. Um, but it's clear that we just have to get right down to the level of people not seeing as many people as closely as they clearly have been. I want to put this question to, to both of you and start with you, Dr. Bogosh. When you hear the numbers, like when you woke up today and, and, and heard what the case numbers were in Ontario, what was your reaction? I mean, it's, it's concerning. It's certainly concerning. And it's just, a, it's just another sign that we need to do better on many, many fronts. And Dr. Saxinger, I know you touched on it before. I, I sort of sense your tone was almost discouragement. But, but you tell me as you see those numbers come in. Well, I mean, we're starting to see increasing case numbers in older people, which usually in many jurisdictions means that hospitals are, are next and ICUs are next. And a lot of us in healthcare look at that with, I think, really kind of grim resolve more than anything. It's not an optimistic feeling. We just would like to be able to limit the damage and continue to provide care to people who need non-COVID care. And so it's a very um, kind of walking the edge time, I think, right now. And we're really going to be looking for those numbers to get better. And, and so speaking of hospitals, I'm not asking you, Dr. Saxinger, to, to give us the sort of pan-Alberta view, but, but what are you seeing at the hospital that you're, you're at? Um, there's been a steady increasing trickle of cases coming in, uh, many of them actually in their 50s, um, but some more older as well. And I think that we're already seeing a lot of healthcare workers being quarantined for symptoms including myself, and people um, having to be off work for, for illness and COVID testing. And so the system is already showing signs of strain before the numbers go up, honestly. And, and I should ask you, showing symptoms but not testing positive for COVID-19? Right. I'm, I'm recovering from what seems to be a non-COVID cold, but it's a bad look to walk around coughing and sneezing in the hospital right now. Yeah. And, and Dr. Bogosh, we have about 30 seconds, but I know I asked you this last week, but what have you been seeing the last few days at your hospital in Toronto? Yeah, we still are seeing uh, people admitted to hospital with COVID-19. Yeah, we've got a, you know, if we were looking at our hospital, for example, in the summer, we know, we didn't have a COVID unit. We didn't have any patients admitted for a period of time with COVID-19. And now we do. And we have a dedicated COVID unit that, that needed to be uh, recreated. And certainly if we take a step back and look at Ontario, the bigger picture on Ontario, there is a real trend in a growing, uh, growing rate of hospitalization of patients with COVID-19. So it's real, it's happening, and we've got to get, it, uh, get this under control quickly. As you know, always appreciate your time, Dr. Isaac Bogosh and Dr. Lenora Saxinger. Thanks to both of you. My pleasure. Thank you. When we come back, a look at what a Biden presidency could mean for Canada. It'll be much harder for a Canadian Prime Minister to say no to a popular American president. The new challenges a new administration may bring. But first, inside the changing politics of Arizona, why the Republican state could flip this November.
Hello, Arizona. It's great to be back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arizona. Get out and vote. In the race for the White House, Arizona is on everyone's radar. Both the Republican and Democratic parties are pushing hard to win because the state's 11 electoral college votes aren't a lock for either team. Turning that state blue would be a feat, something not done in nearly a quarter of a century. But as Paul Hunter shows us, there are plenty of people who say this is the year. Okay, let's start with the first door. Lucia Salinas is hoping to make a bit of political history here in the early October heat of Maricopa County, Arizona. We are from Case Action, and we just want to talk to you about these elections coming up. Along with a friend, she's aiming for what not so long ago might have seemed all but impossible in Arizona, putting a Democrat in the White House. You have to vote, right? Yeah. And right now we are uh, supporting Joe Biden. Right? This is a state that's voted Democrat for president just once since 1948. But guess what? It might now actually happen again. What do you think about Joe Biden? That's my guy. Lucia's message is blunt. Nice. I like that. She sees Donald Trump as a racist and a leader who's failed to lead on the issue of 2020, COVID. The real criminal here is him. He knew what was coming up and he didn't do nothing about it. So that's why I want him out of office. If we let Trump win, everything's gonna go down. So I cannot let that happen. Historically strongly Republican, Maricopa County, with its sprawling city of Phoenix, is the fastest growing county in America, including a burgeoning new Hispanic population that leans Democrat, and lately into the suburbs, newcomers in droves, notably from strongly Democratic California. Arizona's people and politics are changing. But it really, it underlines the divide. In the also, mm -hmm. right? in Absolutely. those fabled Absolutely. suburbs, Absolutely. that other group Democrats Absolutely. covet. Middle-class white yeah, Americans, now with more evidence of what you might call the Trump effect. Ilk. What do you think this country's in for if, he, if Donald Trump gets reelected? More, more division, more violence, more riots. Former Trump fan more Peg O'Brien knows that it's people like her who may now make, make the difference. difference. Who did you vote for in 2016? In 2016, I voted for... Donald Trump. Who are you going to vote for in 2020? Joe Biden. Her advice to others who voted for Trump four years ago? Look deep into themselves and look at their own values and say, does this man reflect my values? And if he doesn't, the answer is simple. Don't vote for him. Vote for, vote for Biden. At a Spanish-language radio talk show, more evidence Arizona's changing. The Hispanic vote, he says, will make a difference. Back in 2016, Yasser Sanchez was a card-carrying Republican. While he did not vote for Trump, Trump's behavior in office gave Sanchez no choice. He quit the Republican Party altogether. Not only will I be voting Joe Biden, I'm campaigning actively to get out the vote for Joe Biden. We need to get rid of Donald Trump. The direct attacks on the weak, the direct attacks on immigrants, the direct attack on anybody that has a different point of view. Still, for the record, at least for now, Arizona remains Trump country, in some quarters, fiercely so. On the night of the first presidential debate, inside a crowded bar past those COVID warnings, the mostly maskless Trump supporters watch their guy on the big screen. <laughs> debate watch party organizer Chelsea Reynolds told us why she still stands by Trump. We're not a cult, we just respect him. He makes me proud to live here. And, and I did not think it was possible to love my country more than I do, but he literally makes me proud. I mean, I see pictures of him or I see funny things he says and I'm like he's a real person and he makes me want to fight every day for him. Hi welcome to Sylvia's how are you today? That view is echoed the next She's day at a small eatery not far away with a Mexican-American owner underlining that not all Hispanics oppose Trump. Do you want cheese hun? Sylvia Menchaca like loves the guy she believes flat else? out 
that He's it? good he for goes. small businesses like hers. He wants us to have jobs. He wants to make us, make us wealthy again. He's the man of the hour. He's the man this country needs right now. Did you want a receipt? Indeed, that's the essence of Trump's support broadly. Pure belief in the man. At this pop-up shop in the far reaches of Phoenix, Trump merch flies off the shelves. Trump voters proudly showing off their gear. And of course, you got to have Rosie the Riveter. Everybody knows who she is. And there's a by now familiar refrain. He's done so much for the public, for the people. He is not racist. He's turned the economy around. He's turned the recession around. Truth is, you don't see many of these kinds of places for Joe Biden. But you do see newly emboldened Democrats all over the place. Here, more volunteers working to get the vote out. To be clear, indeed, polls put Biden out front. But with the vote just days away, the whole thing has left Arizona deeply divided. You all think Biden's leading. It's so funny. You have no idea how many there are that are for Trump. Watch what happens in Maricopa County. Watch what happens in Arizona. Arizona is going for Joe Biden. To me, that would be the perfect, the perfect ending of a, of a bad dream. Dreams on both sides, in the place that just might decide everything. Paul Hunter, CBC News in Maricopa County, Arizona. Up next, what Canadians should know about Joe Biden. From trade issues to the energy sector, why this country's challenges with the U.S. won't all go away if a new president wins. Over the last four years, we've all become very familiar with what a Donald Trump presidency looks like for the U.S. and for Canada. But what if Joe Biden wins on November 3rd? Alexander Panetta takes us through what a Biden presidency could mean for Canadians. It's been a tumultuous American election year, gripped by civil unrest, conspiracy theories, historic job losses, and a deadly virus that has killed more Americans than World War I, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined. If he becomes president, Joe Biden will face a pile of challenges. Canadians know from experience that decisions made here in Washington affect everyone. So how would a Biden presidency affect Canada? Let's break it down, starting with a pillar of his platform. He proposed clean energy revolution, which could have an immediate effect in Alberta. After years of delay and disruption, construction is now just barely underway on the Keystone XL pipeline. It would carry nearly a fifth of Canada's oil exports to the U.S. This massive project is, once again, under threat. If Biden becomes president, he has vowed to cancel Keystone XL, which brings us to his sweeping climate plan. So today, I'm announcing my plan for clean energy revolution. It outlines what we have to do to meet this challenge head on. That clean energy revolution would be fueled by nearly $2 trillion in spending to overhaul the electrical grid. Biden would immediately rejoin the Paris Accord, then push other nations to do more. He'd maybe even impose carbon tariffs on the worst polluters. This is something Canada needs to watch. Right now, it's falling short of its Paris targets. This tariff talk brings us to international trade, which matters a lot to Canada, given how many of our exports are sold to the U.S. The Trump administration has unleashed waves of disruption, battering the WTO, hammering other countries with tariffs. But let's be clear, some of these challenges would persist under Biden. Softwood lumber, buy American. These irritants aren't going away. The federal government spends taxpayers' money. We should use it to buy American products and support American jobs. Remember that $2 trillion climate plan? Well, Biden wants that work going to U.S. companies. But when it comes to other aspects of trade, he promises to be friendlier. That means no more national security tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum, which Trump has imposed in the past and threatens to impose again. Susan Rice, who was a top contender to be Biden's running mate, says these tariffs should never have happened. To say, as Donald Trump has, that we're going to impose steel and aluminum tariffs on Canada because Canada poses a national security threat to the United States, when Canada has been by our side, in every major conflict. I mean, this is offensive.
old alliances are being rattled in other areas too, like national defense. In his memoir, former Trump aide John Bolton writes that the current president constantly complains about NATO. He and others fear Trump might even leave the alliance in a second term. Joe Biden, on the other hand, is a firm believer in NATO, which has underpinned Western defense policy for three quarters of a century. A renewed American commitment to NATO would carry benefits for Canada, but also potentially new risks for Canadian soldiers. A Biden presidency will make Canadians safer in Latvia, where we have troops based there to deter the Russians. On the other hand, the job of NATO may become more expansive, where NATO actually gets asked to do things. Maybe there are things to do, maybe there are new missions, and it'll be much harder for a Canadian prime minister to say no to a popular American president than to say uh, no to an unpopular American president who's probably not asking for much. A similar pattern repeats itself when it comes to China. Biden believes in alliances, yet alliances carry responsibilities. He plans to host a summit of democracies where countries can share their ideas on countering autocracy. There's already mounting pressure from the U.S. on multiple fronts to restrict trade with China in new technologies. But Canadians have learned angering China comes with a cost. After the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou at the request of the U.S., Canadian pork, beef and canola farmers were all punished. And Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig are still languishing in Chinese prisons. U.S.-China tensions won't disappear with a Biden win. In this city, the mood toward Beijing has soured. In that Congress, bills targeting China over human rights abuses have passed with 100% support from both parties. So the superpowers will continue to clash, and Canada will continue to find itself caught in the middle. Cannot be here. Another important change involves immigration. Canada has felt the impact of Trump's numerous crackdowns, but the number of asylum seekers at the border is only a small fraction of it. In the past four years, Canada has enjoyed a historic boom in skilled immigration. As rules for U.S. visas kept tightening, more and more skilled workers and students looked north. All of that could soon change under Biden, who won't be nearly as strict and that probably means stiffer competition for that talent. So American influence touches virtually every aspect of Canadian life, from our economy, to our security, to the air we breathe. Pierre Trudeau famously compared living next to the US to sleeping with an elephant. We'll always feel its twitches, even after November 3rd, though the nature and the frequency of those twitches could vary if Joe Biden wins this White House. And Alex, how much of a focus do you expect a Biden administration would place on Canada? Well, I, I don't think he placed a huge focus on international issues at the start of his administration. Frankly, Joe Biden would take office with more challenges than just about all but three presidents over the last century. And that means that he'd spend a lot of time focusing on things like health care. Ten percent of Americans lack health insurance. And depending on the outcome of a Supreme Court case, it could be far more than that. And he'll want to get a health care bill through Congress. So that's the kind of thing he'll be focusing on. That being said, the reason we started off this piece with the environment is I do believe he'll re-enter the Paris Accord quickly and look to have a conversation with countries like Canada about climate change. All right. Alex Panetta, thank you. Thank you. After the break, a birthday request heard around the world. How these BC parents plan to deliver a surprise their nine-year-old won't forget. That's next in our moment. Damien Smith is turning nine next month, but since moving to a new city two weeks ago, he was worried he'd be spending his birthday without his friends. So his parents reached out to the world for help, asking people on Facebook to mail in birthday cards in order to help Damien feel less alone. And the response has been overwhelming. It's our moment. And I asked him, oh, are you going to be excited about your birthday? He's like, no, I'm just going to be sad and lonely. We felt for it right away. He thought maybe like our friends and family would like send Damien cards. So he said, okay, guys, like, I kind of, you know, I would like to get some cards for my son. But then all of a sudden his status is being shared everywhere in different places. Then all of a sudden it was coming from Delta and Vancouver, Ontario, Toronto. We have 300 yeah. or something now. It's only been five days of us collecting mail. 
we're kind of overwhelmed. The union has no ideas. When this started to kind of explode, we're like, we can use these to give him more confidence. He deserves to feel like he's worth it. Among the people who responded, a big Hollywood star, but as you heard, he doesn't know, and his parents are making sure that he doesn't watch the program tonight, because you know, for the Sunday National, nine-year-olds, big demographic for us, so good thing that they've kept him away from the television. That is the National for October the 25th. Good night.